Okay, now in this video, let me explain how we train Aniline using the concept of automatic differentiation in PyTorch. So I prepared a, a code notebook here where I have three different implementations of Aniline. First uh, is the manual implementation that we yeah, saw last week. Then I have an implementation using the grad function that I just explained in the previous video. And then I show you an even more automatic way using the backward function that uh, PyTorch automatically creates based on a forward function. And that is also a topic I will then dive in uh, more in the next video. So here I want to just show you how it works and the next uh, video I explain it a little bit more. All right, so starting again with Watermark, checking our versions here. I can also make this a little bit bigger. So here again, this is our yeah, Adeline model that we talked about extensively last week, where we have multiple inputs, the weights, the net input function, the activation function is just a, yeah, a identity function, and then the threshold function for prediction. All right, let's uh, import some libraries we will be using. The grad function I explained in the previous video, and we will also make use of the functional API. Again, the functional API will be a more uh, a discussion topic in more detail in the next video. So we will be working with the iris data set again because it's simple. So we can then focus more on the code rather than on the data set. So here we have now loaded the data set. And this is exactly the same as we have done in the previous week. week. So if you're unsure how this works, this is exactly the same code as last week. So you can go to the video from last week. So there, everything uh, is explained in that video last week. All right, so also just to recap, this is exactly the same code that we were using last week. So here, this is our Adeline implementation where we first initialize the weights and the bias. Uh, we have our forward function that computes the net inputs and then the activation. And then we have the backward function where we computed the gradient by ourselves. So what I mean by that is we derived it in the slides. We had a slide on how we derived that gradient and then here, this would be the equivalent code implementation of that. Um, yeah, we have some uh, training and evaluation wrappers just to make things a bit more convenient to look at. So we have a loss function that we compute where we can plot the loss function during training. So here in our training function, again, like in last week, we have a cost list with, where we compute the cost, which is actually yeah the loss over the epoch or mini batch actually. So let me see. So what we do is we iterate over the epochs. So for each epoch, we shuffle the data set and then we create the mini batches. Then for each mini batch here, we perform the forward pass that is like predicting uh, yeah, the class labels. Um, and then we compute the backward pass. So here, this is um, computing the negative gradients, the negative gradient of the loss with respect to the weights and the bias. And then we update the weights. So we update it by, um, yeah, we have the original weight. We update it by adding the negative gradient multiplied with the learning rate. Why, well, for some reason, commented that out. Yeah, I think it was just too much output and uh, I wanted to keep this notebook short because there will be other codes and it was too long otherwise, too detailed. We don't need that level of detail here. Here we are just um, printing the number of epochs and the loss for each epoch. So let's define it. So note, this is not running any code because it's just uh, setting up the functions here. And then here we are defining or initializing the model. So X train size, this is the same. I could have used shape. This is the shape, same as shape. So it's the number of features. It's the same as um, shape one number of features um, then yeah here this is our data set oh yes, input the number of epochs 20 learning rate 0.01 the random seed so we can reproduce these results so that means if someone else like you runs this code you should get, e get exactly the same results um, and then the mini batch size how many mini batches we use in each um, iteration note um, the random seed here is only used for shuffling the data set right if I go up again this is uh, being used when we here shuffle the data set so if you change the random seed you might get some different results all right so let's do this 
So this is training and this is super fast. So you can see the outputs here uh, immediately here. Usually for deep learning, it would take maybe, it depends really, but it could take 10 minutes per epoch and take an hour per epoch, depends really on the data set. So let's take a look at the loss. Okay, this is yeah, converging. It's not converged yet, but it doesn't really matter because here the point is really uh, explaining the automatic gradient um, computation in the next code. I want to, I'm, why I'm showing you this is so that you can compare the automatic way of PyTorch of doing this with this one and you will see it's exactly the same result. So just to show you that our conceptual thing, or thing that we did manually last week is actually correct and or other way around that PyTorch is actually correct. All right, so here that's the predictions for computing the test and training accuracies. Also, um, it's essentially the same concept as last week, so nothing new here. Now, after we just recapped uh, yeah, the manual implementation of the N-Align that we talked about last week, now let's do this semi-automatically or semi-manually using this Autograd API from PyTorch. So there will be only very subtle changes. So this one is exactly the same as before. Now the only difference is in the train method. So let me scroll to the relevant part. So notice everything here is the same. What has changed is now how we compute the gradients here. So now we use this grad function to compute the gradients of the loss with respect to the model weights. And then we retain the graph. Remember from last uh, video, this is um, if we need again gradients, we need to retain it one more time. So because we want to compute the bias here too. And then here we don't care because um, in the next round it will be constructed from scratch the graph. So here we don't need to retain the graph. Uh, why the minus one? So that is because we want to have the negative gradient because then we, we add the negative gradient to the model weight. We could also just skip this step. Of course, right, we can do it like this and add a minus here. Oops, same thing. But just to keep it consistent with the implementation that we had before, our manual implementation, I wanted to make it as similar as possible. All right, so the only difference to before is now that how we compute the gradients. Notice that there is no backward function now. If I scroll up again, show it to you again. In the previous time, um, we had backward here to compute the gradients, where backward was our yeah, manual way of computing the gradients. Now we do it automatically. See, this is actually because of the scrolling is why I commented out the logging, because otherwise it would be a lot of stuff to scroll here. All right, um, back to the thing here. So yeah, here, here this is the difference. Instead of using backward with our manual gradients, we now use this grad function, um, except that everything should be the same. I made a small modification here to the logging. Notice that I use uh, with torch no grad because when we just do some logging here, we don't do any model training here. We don't need to construct the graph. It would be computationally wasteful to um, build the graph because otherwise it will um, create the graph in our forward method. So here, this one, because we have set a requires gradient to true, if this is set to true, every time this is used, it will create this computation graph. Okay, so here, the computation graph gets destroyed because we don't have retain graph to true. So every time we do the for loop here, it makes a new graph. Here, we don't call grad, right? So here, it would create a graph, but we don't need this graph. And it would be just computationally wasteful. It's just a good habit if we don't need a graph, if we don't need to compute gradients here for logging, then we can use this with torch no gradient context and everything that is indented, uh, so everything that is below here does not construct a computation graph. It's just to save computational resources. Here it's such a simple code, it doesn't matter, but it does matter for deeper neural networks. Um, all right, so defining it, then again, same as before, we initialize the model. Notice that this now at line two instead of at line one, uh, then yeah, training the model. 
So we can see again the loss goes down. Da -da 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 -da. And let's take a look at the plot. Should look exactly like before. Let's compute the training accuracy and test accuracy. Also the same as before. You can actually double check. These are exactly the same numbers as the ones here. All right. So this is now doing things more conveniently, right? So because you can think of it, um, if I scroll up again, I don't want to scroll that much, but I think it's useful here in this case. So if this forward one would be a very long, complicated function using multiple layers and stuff like that, you can already see how it's convenient to not implement this backward method by hand, by deriving that by hand, right? I mean, it's a good exercise still, but it is also very error prone for deep neural networks. So it's better to rely on these automatic functions. However, there is an even more convenient way to do this that I want to show you now. So um, this is usually how people, most people use PyTorch. So you can actually um, use this so-called linear layer here. So this is, uh, as, as I explained last week, this is uh, computing the net input. I have now an additional step. So here I have this zero. So what's going on here? So usually when we use torch.nn.linear, it's thinking we want to implement some multi-layer neural network because that's what most people do in deep learning. And then it will initialize the weights to small random numbers. This would be also totally fine for our adder line here. However, to make our adder line com implementation here more comparable to the previous two codes I showed you before where we used uh, zero weights, I also want to use zero weights. So I'm setting these weights to zero here. So just to show you what I mean, um, let me just do this. All right, let me just use like this. And then uh, I should have, of course, assigned it to something. But you can see that these should be small random values. See that? And if I set them to zero, they will be, oops. Ah, this is the problem, you have to detach it. It doesn't like it if you have, um, uh, variable defined and you want to modify it like um, in place leaf variable means a leaf uh, it's like an endpoint and it doesn't like it if you modify it with an in-place operation because it's also error prone this is usually something you don't want to do in a network so it's kind of warning you so you have to detach it from the graph here oops there we go so now I set it to zero also notice I didn't I didn't do this here equal to because there's a convention in PyTorch. Uh, there are these so-called in-place operations. These with the underscore, they do an um, operation in place. So there's no return value actually. Um, it just takes the existing vector and overwrites it. This is also done for computational efficiency because imagine you have a very large um, vector and then you want to overwrite it with all zeros. You would have to in memory briefly create two vectors. You have the original one, then the zero vector, and the zero vector overrides the original one. So in a brief moment in time, you would have two vectors in memory and it would take twice as much memory. So if you do this with large matrices, it can in certain GPUs be yeah, a problem. I mean, it's just wasteful. So in this case, these underscore operations modify something in place. But yeah, I'm getting sidetracked here. Let's go back to what's going on here. So um, here I'm now defining the forward pa uh, pass, oh, sorry, the weights used in the forward pass using this linear uh, wrapper. We talked about this briefly last week. And then, so I'm assigning it to self.linear. And then I'm using it in the forward method here. So here, I'm computing the uh, net inputs using self.linear. Then I'm computing the activations. The activations, that's um, nothing, an identity function. So I'm just overwriting it and then I'm returning it. All right, so here, now I'm training it again. Notice the only things I define are this weight layer here and this forward method here. I'm not defining anything else. In the train function, this is uh, fundamentally very similar to before, except now, see I'm computing the loss here. So I'm computing 
uh, loss function. I'm using here the MSE loss. I could use my own loss, but like I mentioned, if there is a function that is already implemented in PyTorch, I recommend using that one over your own implementation because it's usually more efficient. Um, they use some tricks under the hood, also C++ code to implement things more efficiently. So here we are using this MSE loss. And then we are resetting the gradients uh, using zero grad and calling backward. So there are multiple steps that are new now that are happening here. So calling forward to predict the outputs, the class labels, so compute outputs. Um, then it's actually not the class labels, it's the net inputs the, because it's before the threshold function. Let me scroll up one more time. So we are, we are here. This, this value here, we are computing this value. All right, uh, where was I? So we're computing this value, y hat. Um, oh, this is the previous one, sorry. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, here, forward. So we are computing this y hat value. Then we um, compute the prediction error using the mean squared error here. Notice that I'm resetting gradients from the previous iteration. So this will be running multiple times. And there is how PyTorch works. There is a dot grad attribute that will be set for these leaf variables after each iteration. And we are resetting it. Otherwise, you would be accumulating the gradients. So usually it's not the case in deep learning. We usually compute the gradients, update the weights, then do the next round, compute the gradients, update the, way, update the weights. But there are some applications where we want to, for example, uh, not update the weights after each epoch. For example, we can do two forward passes and then update the weights. So this would be possible. We could, for example, skip zeroing the gradients. So we, are, we could technically, for certain research experiments, accumulate the experiments. So this is why PyTorch has this implementation to allow certain researchers to do some more flexible research, but it also, as a normal user, forces us to remember to zero the gradients. So here, the opt so we are also using, I should say, an optimizer, stochastic gradient descent, that is more automatically than what we have done before. So prediction, computing the loss, zeroing the gradients from the previous round, calling backward, that computes our gradients, and then updating the weights. So this is usually a typical PyTorch workflow. That is what people do, usually in practice, and what we do when we do um, implement neural networks. In the previous round, we had it manually. So we had uh, computed forward and then we had our loss function but then we computed here the negative gradients and we did the stuff here the update automatically this is what in our code implementation uh, below is equal to optimizer step so how does optimizer know that we want to update the weight and the bias well that is because we feed it with the parameters i will show you here we um, we provide it here, see, with model parameters. So there's also a concept. If you use these functions like torch.linear, these will be registered as model parameters in this module here. So here this will automatically contain the model parameters. Let me actually show it to you. So here we have, where was it? If I scroll up, oh, we haven't actually defined it yet, sorry. So let me execute this part first and then I will show you more details. All right, so I already ran this, so everything should, well, I can actually also, ah, it's fine. So here you can see, okay, maybe can't because it's a generator. So you can see there are these um, two entries. One is actually the weights and one is the bias. So they are registered under the parameters. So these are really the values that we have as model.fc.weight. No, what was it? Mm, how did we save it? One second. Oh, linear, we called it linear, not fc. Okay. So you can see these are 
corresponding to this one and this one is corresponding to this one. So this is uh, how the optimizer knows what to update when we call step. I can maybe also show you um, model linear dot wait. There should be a grad. So this is the gradient. It's the gradient from training it. So from the backward pass. And if we call backward the next round, it will add to this gradient, so it will grow. So this one should actually oops, make it zero. So let's execute this. Ah, doesn't work. Oh, it's uh, it's because it's um, defined outside this um, outside this function here. That's a little bit unfortunate. Um, yeah, it would be a bit tricky to show it to you here. Maybe I can can do it differently. I can um, do it here before. After. Oops, it's. All right, it's actually none. Oh, it's okay. No, it's something else. It's, I think, the first round. So, yeah, I can see first it's um, this, and then after zero, this, and then it's this, and this. You can see how it's uh, computed, then zeroed, computed, zeroed. If I don't do this one, it will just grow larger and larger. You can see that it. Uh, maybe not because it's a positive and negative value. Yeah, you can see how, how large it becomes. That's actually not good. So here the model wouldn't learn anything useful, I guess. Um, let's see. Yeah, you can see it's not learning anything useful. So let's fix that. All right, let's fix this here and run it properly. All right. And you can see this is the same as before when I compute the test and training accuracy. Look at these value, uh, values, 92.86% and 93.33%. And this is exactly the same accuracy. Let me scroll up to our manual implementation. This is exactly the same number here. So you can see PyTorch um, is performing exactly the same thing we do manually. So our manual derivatives are correct and vice versa, PyTorch is also correct. So I will talk about this uh, more in the slides, um, explaining this again. But I think um, if this is still unclear, um, maybe focus on this part. So this is really how we use PyTorch, like forward, compute the loss, zero the gradients, backward, update. And this is essentially a PyTorch in a nutshell. And we can use this API for all types of models. So the only difference is really um, here when we define the weight parameters and the forward pass. So this is the only difference. The training loop is essentially always the same. All right, then let me stop this video and then go back into the slides and explain to you a little bit more about the PyTorch API.